I mean, I'm just such an advocate of, you know, becoming congruent, you know, with yeah. your outside matching what's on the inside mm-hmm. instead of portraying something fake. Uh, but I believe, Brenda, that the church has done such a terrible job at providing an atmosphere for us mm-hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Because, you know, we 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 act say that Jesus is not up there with a whip. God's not up there with a whip, you know, coming down on us. But you better not screw up, <laughs> you know, yeah. or we will. <laughs> you know. Hello, friends. I'm Brenda Crouch. I believe the winds of global change compel us to the mysteries that speak to path and purpose. In a time of amplified chaos, there is a divine compass to navigate the conditions that drive our everyday decisions. For the next 30 minutes, we'll explore stories and the knowledge of sojourners who will point the way to the secrets that lie before us. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, friends, and welcome to Inside Voice. Have you ever looked at your pastor's wife or a pastor's wife in general and thought, gosh, it must be nice. You've really got it made. Well, I wonder if you might know that leaders oftentimes are carrying burdens that you're unaware of. Sometimes they're carrying pain, pain from their past, things they've never processed, things that might not be brought to the surface yet but yet they still have the pressures of having to lead, having to live and be an example for others. Well, such was the case for my friend, Pastor Hope Carpenter. She was the leader of a megachurch. She was under a lot of pressure. And these things started culminating to where she had to face some things in her, in her past. It was at the point of this crossroads where she had to face some of the things that she'd never dealt with before as her world became unraveled. But in this time, she discovered it would be her greatest gift and it would be her new beginning. I want you to be encouraged not to judge people from a shallow perspective, but to listen because leaders just like you and I have to also heal from the things that they carry. So my guest today is Pastor Hope Carpenter. She is the co-founder of Redemption Church, a megachurch that started in Greenville, South Carolina, and now has additional campuses in San Jose, California, and the Dominican Republic. Redemption Church reaches a large global audience, which is seen on the Hillsong Channel and Daystar, among other platforms, where Hope ministers to women around the world. She's an author. She's a gifted speaker. And her book, The Most Beautiful Disaster, is a transparent story of her journey to truth and to freedom. And I want to welcome you, my friend, Pastor Hope Carpenter. You're a dear friend, and I'm so glad that you're with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Brenda. It's great to see you, and you're looking gorgeous as ever. Well, thank you. (laughs) You're just beautiful as you can be always. Thank you. Well, listen, I want to, I don't want to lose any time. I want you to kind of start from the beginnings of where your story, your life began to unravel and your story was really just beginning to reveal itself. Tell us what it looked like for you all those years ago when things began to surface and you really didn't know who you were anymore. You didn't know what you were dealing with. What did life look like for you and Ron at the time? Absolutely. Oh, I mean, it's like you got to go all the way back. So we're not going to take all day to do this. I'll do <laughs> right. it in the most concise right. way I can. But around when I was 35 years old and I just turned 53. So thank God, oh, you know, we have overcome right. <laughs> all of this trauma. And here we are today. Yes. So let's just do the spoiler alert. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, if it looks like the darkest day. That's the kind of God we serve to take us out of all that mess, redeem Amen. it, make it work for his glory and for our good. But mm-hmm. when I was 35 years old, I remember waking up one day, Brenda, and I thought, you know, I just can't live this way anymore. And mm. and it was almost strange to me because to the natural eye, it looked like I had a, an amazing life. And I did. Had, mm-hmm. the, had an amazing husband, great children. A church finally that could, you know, where we could go out to eat on Friday night and we weren't living on welfare money anymore. It was just tough times in ministry, but we were actually on our feet and doing well. The church was thriving and growing. And, but I remember waking up and thinking, 
what's wrong with me? You know, mm-hmm. there's something quaking and there's so much pressure on the inside of me. And, and it almost made me feel crazy because in the natural, I looked and it looked good. But on the inside, I felt yeah. mess, a shambled mess. Mm. So I woke up that day and said, I can't live like this anymore. Didn't know what that meant. Didn't know what it looked like. Um, so I made a series of, of choices that day. I, if we laugh about it today, um, you know, being the preacher's wife, you're not supposed to do any of these things. I'm right. about to I did. <laughs> um, you know, that day is when I went and bought a six pack of beer, bought three secular CDs and a bikini bathing suit, because up until that point, I was the prim and proper, everything quaffed. Wow. Your children mm-hmm. show up to church. You never say an ugly word. You never, you know, cross anybody. It's yes, sir, to your husband and thank you, please, and all mm-hmm. the sweet things you do in church. And not that any of that is wrong, but I felt so fake all these years. Mm-hmm. And, and I woke up that day and I said, you know, I'm going to do some things for hope. I'm going to see how it feels. I'm going to see how, you know, where this goes. It didn't go anywhere good, but I've learned after many years of counseling that that what I started that day, that was a nine year process for me was what psychiatrists, psychologists call individuation. And it is something that's supposed to happen when you're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. It's a series of, you know, touching your finger to the stove, so to speak, and getting burned and learning your own lessons. And the home I grew up in, that was never allowed. Mm -hmm. Extremely religious, extremely abusive, um, you know, just straighten up, fly right, do what I say. You don't have an opinion. You know, you're not going to the school dance. You're not going to spend the night with these people. You know, you got to be perfect. Right. And so that for nine years for me, Brenda, it was a long, hard road um, trying to figure out life and trying to say, what does hope think is right? What does hope feel is wrong? You know, being that rebellious teenager, but it started at 35 years old, you know, what the world calls a midlife crisis is not a midlife crisis. It's just all the pain and the yeah. hurt coming out mm-hmm. for everybody to see. And, yeah. uh, you know, it breaks my heart even to this day to see people mm-hmm. because, you know, I've been there, done that, and I see it yes. happening in other yes. leaders and I want to grab them and I want to hug them and uh-huh. say, you don't need to do this. Come to counseling. Let me help you. Let me send you yeah. here. You don't want to destroy your life because mm-hmm. I did. I almost destroyed everything. Brenda, yeah. I, you know, in 2013, I couldn't live like that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I, mm-hmm. you never start off those days thinking I'm going to start drinking alcohol on a daily basis, or mm-hmm. I'm going to have an affair or be unfaithful. Mm-hmm. You, that never crossed my mind, yeah. but that one little turn into, you know, when I was 35 years old, started me down a road of rebellions and rebellions and rebellions. And I looked back and I was so far off the mark and I had hurt so many people. And it was like, I just woke up in 2013 and said, what am I doing? This is not yeah. who I am. That mm-hmm. wasn't who I was, but this is not who I am either. Mm-hmm. And my mm-hmm. life crashed. I came to my husband and I uh, confessed to everything that had happened. And boy, the way I thought it would happen at that point yeah. did not happen. I thought he was right. going to wrap his arms around me and be my uh-huh. knight in shining armor like he's always <laughs> been. And say, we're going to fix this. But no, he said, you got 30 minutes, get your clothes and get out of here. Because it had been a rough, rough road yeah. for nine years in our house. And that is, that's what sparked my book, The Most Beautiful Disaster. That's what yeah. sparked title because what the world thought was the most horrible thing to me it was God saving my life and amen that's Genesis 22 you know what the enemy means for evil yeah against our life God he means it for good it's the Romans 8 28 he can take anything and everything and he does because he sees Mm. our life in this panoramic view we only see what we're doing but God's not walking through time with us but he knew all this and he saw this and he knew that he was going to redeem it and he knew that he was going to use it to for what I'm doing even today to get the glory for the salvation of many right and what's so beautiful is how 
the Lord, he does look at every one of us and, and probably thinks, what a beautiful disaster, you know, because he's I mean, the one that brings, that completes us. And I think, you know, if we remember that there is no condemnation when we're in Christ, uh, there's no condemnation there. And what I think is so beautiful about your journey, Hope, is that at that point, even though it was as painful as it was, it was more painful to continue to carry a lie, to continue to have to uh, be something that you felt was, um, in, in, in what's the word, disingenuous. And, yeah. and, you know, if you can't do that from an authentic place, there's something wrong. So you were really, you began to listen to some of the bells and whistles and alarms that were going off internally and going, something's wrong here. And so it really was probably one of the most authentic moves you mm. had ever made at that point in your life. And yet it was the thing that burst the bubble. So, but you know, what not is a that? very good authentic move when you're on a public stage. <laughs> no, Well, that's what makes it so difficult. And that's why I opened this program today the way that I did, because you listen, there's a lot of mudslinging that goes on in our culture and within the church when we have such high expectations for leaders but you know what? We are all human beings. And the what Jesus looks at us is as a process and as someone who's an image bearer. And as we get closer and closer to him, we're having to dispel the things that were inauthentic, the things that maybe weren't coming from a place of truth. And so oftentimes we're going about doing good, but not from a real authentic place. And so now when I that's look at you and what you're doing, no joy. yeah, exactly. That's joy in the journey. Exactly. So now you're able to give the fruit from your basket that you have, that, that you're not having to uh, manufacture yourself. You know, we, we can't, we can't create those things in a, uh, inauthentically. We're like the fig tree that Jesus cursed with no fruit, but we got all these leaves. We're projecting. Yeah. I've got fruit, but, but I don't have fruit when it really comes down to it. And so I just want to commend you and sing your praise right now for having the courage, number one, to face those things and then to be able to be honest with those that were important to you and with the the broader audience. And it, you've, you've walked a transparent journey, but I believe that's what Jesus calls us to. And you know, I, I would like for you to be able to speak to that for those who are struggling with uh, projecting an image, but yet their real life, their the depth of their soul looks a lot different. Yeah. How do you face those fears and how do you face the anxiety that it causes when you feel like I'm going to lose it all? If I get yeah. honest here, because people are bound and there's a lot of things happening in the private sanctums of our homes uh, behind the scenes that um, are destroying families. Can you speak to that for a yes. moment? We talk about it a lot in my circles, in my home, with my children, with my friends that, I mean, I'm just such an advocate of, you know, becoming congruent, you know, with yeah. your outside matching what's on the inside mm -hmm. instead of portraying something fake. Uh, but I believe, Brenda, that the church has done such a terrible job at providing an atmosphere for us to be honest. Yeah. Because, you know, we, 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 we act say that Jesus is not up there with a whip. God's not up there with a whip, you know, coming down on us, but you better not screw up, <laughs> you know, yeah. or we will. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So we're terrible representatives of his heart. And, you know, I tell my kids all the time, I have one, one of my, one of our three, you know, he's like, I'm not going to jump in unless I'm all in. He's like, you know, yeah. I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be a hypocrite. And, you know, those, that kind of talk. And I'm like, just because you have problems does not mean that you're fake. Just because you slip up doesn't mean that you're a hypocrite. Just because you have marital problems sometimes doesn't mean that you can't serve God with all your heart and join, you know, go in and go all in with God. You know, I think we just have lived in such an environment so long that we feel the pressure, whether 
it's actually put on us by people or is it, it's internal that yeah. we have to be perfect mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. serve God. And mm-hmm. that's why Jesus had to come is because he knew we could not do it. Right. We, we were so messed up and we are so messed up that Jesus mm-hmm. had to come take our place, yeah. you know, because we could not pay the penalty for our sin on our mm-hmm. own. And mm-hmm. if we could all just get such a clear mindset that Jesus did not call us to perfection he mm-hmm. called us to an upward journey. Yes. I press toward the mark. Mm-hmm. It's a daily press. It's a daily struggle yeah. to be more like Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to slap three people today, but I didn't. <laughs> you know, those things don't always go away. Yeah. But it's a yeah. daily press mm-hmm. to become more like Jesus. I told one of my children today, I said, you know, we're all on the same journey. But mm-hmm. we're on different mile markers. Yeah. You know, we're, I might have been serving him 40 years. You've only been serving him 10. I, I don't expect right. you and your yeah. journey and your talk and mm-hmm. your walk to look like mine. Yeah. I don't expect mine to look like somebody else's. Mm-hmm. We've, we've all been raised in so many different atmospheres and places, geographical places, and so many socioeconomic differences in backgrounds. And we bring all that into our relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. And so we're all coming in with all of this stuff here and here. Yeah. Yeah. In our memories, in the way we were raised, the way we were treated, what happened to us. I was raped when I was 15. I was raised in that abusive home. But then I married this guy who came from a family who, when they handled differences, they sat around and held hands and sang kumbaya, you know. And I came from the family, I'm going to pick up a plate and sling it against the wall and say four or five words that's going to stun you. But we're going to be fun. Yeah. You know, yeah. So but we're you know, all on the know, same journey. Yeah, we are. And I love that you're bringing this out because we've got to back off from the whole judgmental thing and being Holy Ghost Jr. and telling yes. somebody else what they ought to be doing for their life to clean them up so that we can be more comfortable. Because you know what? <laughs> Jesus is not uncomfortable with our journey or our process. He's in the midst of it. Yes. He loves his sheep. And I so relate because, you know, Paul and I are complete opposites as well. And yes. I think the first couple of years of our marriage was really all about, gosh, getting to kind of getting to know the wheelhouse of, of what he, where he thinks from and where his family thinks from. And, and I came from just a whole other, you know, place in in thought. And so being able to learn how to process things with, um, consideration of where someone else is coming from means we're, we're gaining perspective and we're learning to grow and enlarge our warehouse so that we can love so that I think the key really is how do we what is the biggest uh, image of of the Godhead that we can bear I believe that it would be the spirit of love you know how do we love and accept someone right where they are now tell me tell us a story about maybe somebody that you've met on the road you are you encounter a lot of women uh, and men and in your ministry and your ministry together with Ron and you guys are doing a new podcast, which is awesome, yeah. by the way. Good like job. That. I love it. Love <laughs> it. Love it. Yes. And, but, you know, tell us, give us some encouraging stories about how um, God is reaching people today with, with just the ability, the, the courage to want to take the mask off and to, lay down their arms and their defenses, so to speak, so that they can get real and honest with God and with each other. Tell us some encouraging things. Brenda, it's so amazing to me. I have reached more people for Jesus Mm -hmm. with my weaknesses. Wow. Than I ever have with my victories. Wow. Wow. And, you know, I just think it's being relatable You know, people do, for whatever reason, we look at leadership and, you know, you started that, the show today with that. We look at leadership and we think that, you know, their breath doesn't stink. They don't have 
and wash their face or wash dishes and they just speak in tongues and praise the Lord yeah. all day and their marriage is perfect and their children love Jesus with all their right. heart. You know, yeah. we just have this image and and it's not true. You know, when I started talking about my journey, the floodgates opened. People, I mean, people in leadership, people, uh, pastors, their wives, their children, church people, just DMing me, calling all over as I traveled with this book with, I can relate, and here's our story. I can relate. Here's our story. Wow. And I told, I was talking to my kids again, because uh, I'm here on the East Coast, so there are two of them are here, the married two with kids. And yeah. So I just try to get everything I can when I'm here. And so I was just talking to him the other day. I said, you know, here's the thing. I said, everybody, we got to bust this myth that there is this right. thing out there called the perfect marriage or a good marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what does that look like? <laughs> so, I mean, who, who has that? Because yeah. how, why? Because uh. there are two, two imperfect humans Come on. living in the same mm-hmm. house. Yeah. Or seven. <laughs> you know, you're going to get on each other's nerves. You're uh-huh. going to want to strangle somebody. You're going to want to put the pillow over them in the night. You know, you yeah. just, you get tired. You get frustrated. You get short. You get ill. You say <laughs> ugly things. Ron calls me, he says this when I get aggravated or whatever. He calls me meanie. He's like, yeah. are you going to be a meanie again tomorrow? Oh, you know, goodness. we have this joke. He said, you're, you're like the Mr. <laughs> Potato Head with the mean, ugly eyes. And, I mean, there's there's just a myth that there is this marriage out there that is just perfect and has no issues. And yeah, I told my kids, I said, you know, if you fail just mm-hmm. because you have those things in your marriage, man, you're going to miss out on the longevity of marriage, yeah. and longevity of love and unconditional mm-hmm. love and the beauty of forgiveness and rebuilding mm-hmm. tr- the strength yeah. and the pylons that go down yeah. in marriage by overcoming mm-hmm. these things. Because you leave this one and you're going to go to the next one. You're going to like, oh, God, they yeah. got all these <laughs> issues too, but they're in different yeah. areas. So, yeah. you know, we've got to bust this myth, Brenda, that mm-hmm. there's this such thing as a perfect marriage, that there's Greener this pasture. Yeah. as this perfect Christian, even. Yeah. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not possible because yeah. we're human. And that's why yeah. Jesus had to come. We're yes. just trying to be like, we're trying to be like our daddy. We're trying every mm. day to look more like him, to treat people like him, to live like him, to yes. love like him, to serve like mm. him. And are we going to screw up and get it wrong? Absolutely. All the time. Mm. That's Goodness. What- that's what grace and mercy is. His mercy is new every single morning because he knew we were going to need it. Yes, it is. And every morning, I'm so grateful for that. I yes. mean, <laughs> I just the think. The first Lord, kiss I get every morning is a yes. kiss. Oh, I love that hope. Yeah. I love that. That's so beautiful. And and the first kiss that we want others to be able to receive. I mean, that just really can take when you're in a, a, I oftentimes will, I I don't know if I should say often, but many times I will wake up just with a heaviness because I've got so much to do in the day and a very little energy maybe to face those things. And, and I think, gosh, I'm not, I'm not equipped right now. And just to have that first kiss with him in the morning, however that comes is, um, that's a, that, that's, that brings a paradigm shift. It's a game changer, you know, for facing a day and knowing his, his mercies are there. Um, you know, another area that I would think of his mercies being so great, uh, for myself. And I mean, we're girlfriends right now talking, and I think that you can relate to this as well is in the area of my child, my children, my grandchildren, how, um, you know, I've seen both the fruit of my mistakes, um, have consequences in my daughter's life and that can bring guilt and condemnation and and you you want that do over you know you want to be able to go and fix and we can't fix those things but all we can do is to be able to model the journey the authentic journey of 
becoming more like Jesus and bringing him into the, allowing him into the taboo places. And so I've also been very honest. Um, I've had those hard conversations with my daughter and you remind me a lot of my daughter, the, just the wiring, you're both blonde and beautiful (laughs) and she's funny and keeps me laughing all the time. But, you know, to have those hard conversations where you're both accountable, but you're also pointing, uh, not in a way of escaping accountability, but just pointing to our great hope and living it authentically has been our saving grace because you know what? I watch her now walking out her faith and choosing her faith, choosing to follow Christ. And and she's going to do it honest. You know, it's like she's, She's I'm not too. the one that's going to throw her, sit, sit on the front row and throw her hands up just because she, she's being told to. Right. She's, she's not going to do anything without it coming from a place of truth. Place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I'm really grateful, you know, for that. I feel like that's a reward in our relationships uh, with right. our children. Like when we do, like you said, we just kind of come clean of the baggage and we say, look, this is me. And that's a hard place to, to come to in those relationships where we have to be vulnerable. There's a vulnerability that comes with that, right? Yeah, because we want to pose perfect to our children, too. Right. Like, right. you know, do it like me. Right. Live like me. <laughs> you know, I want you to be like me this. on a pedestal. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. My kids know, I mean, they they know way too much, probably, all of my issues and all of my flaws. But I just feel like, you know, if I can show them those flaws, but I can also show them I'm never going to stop pursuing God. Yeah. Yeah, I got it wrong. Yeah, I said this. Yeah, I I have to go back and apologize to them, even as grown adults. You know, they're grown. But I but I am also showing them that I'm never going to stop pursuing God. Amen. Never. Yeah. So tell us what the key is. What's your secret to um, keeping Jesus the main thing when, listen, I know what kind of schedule you keep. And I'm, I know from experience how busy life can get when you're involved in multiple production schedules and you're juggling ministry dates and travel dates and you got all these things and the lights and the, you know, all these things that can be distractions. Yes. Tell us, Hope, what is the key for staying grounded, for keeping your relationship in that untainted, pure place with Christ in that honest place? Well, for me, you know, I had to be broken all the way down because I was just everywhere. It had to come. It it has to come out of a place of real healing. Yeah, really does. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was had a lot of mess on the inside of my heart, a lot of pain, a lot of brokenness, a lot of confusion, a lot of unhealed places from, from childhood, from my teenage years. So when you, that, when you're like that, you're broken, Mm -hmm. you got hard places in your heart. You cannot even receive the love of God. You know, your heart is hard. So nothing can get in there. It can't, nothing can be real. Nothing can be authentic. So I had to go through a real breaking Mm -hmm. down process, a real, Mm. A come and clean process, a, a time of getting all the junk out. You know, if a motorcycle pers- rider has an accident and they scrape everything up and there's gravel all in, all over them, they have to spend a lot of time in the ER just yeah. taking the junk out right. before they can Road rash. Uh-huh. So that's what had to happen. I had to get all the junk out and I had mm-hmm. to put it all out on the table and I had to look at it and I had to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And then it took time for me to heal. You know, healing yeah. is a process. Mm. I mean, it took took a while. People, we want it one and done. We want, mm-hmm. okay, I said I'm sorry. You know, okay, right. forgive me. Or I forgave them and I'm going to move on. No, healing's like peeling an onion. It really is. You have to deal it with is. one offense at a time and one hurt at a time, one pain at a time. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes for, you can say I forgive, but for, sometimes you have to forgive from every angle. You can think, mm-hmm. you know, I forgave you, but a year later, maybe I forgave my husband, this is hypothetical, for running up credit cards. Mm-hmm. But a year later, we want to buy a house and then we go to, you know, fill out the loan and then it comes up with well, your credit's terrible. I'm going to have to forgive him all over <laughs> again. See, because I'm mad yeah. again. 
Right. <laughs> you have to forgive from every angle. So healing yeah. and it's a process. So I think first you really yeah. have to dig into your heart to say, you know, why am I the way I am? Yeah. And you have to come clean and you have to have a, like a starting over, even after salvation, yeah. Yeah. you know, for your own mental health, for your own Especially spiritual after. health. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, but now for me, I have to maintain, maintaining my healing and, and, and mm. protecting my heart. Good. Is, is what keeps me right with God. Mm-hmm. I, every day, you know, the Bible, there's a scripture that says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Mm-hmm. And I believe the reason why is because issues in our heart have to be dealt with daily, because if we let them fester, Brenda, they will get root systems. So True. if we hit our fingers and we pluck that little thing out, like plucking mm-hmm. up a brand new weed out of our garden, pluck it. If you deal with it early, it's easy. But if you let it sit and fester, I mean, it will take a shovel. It'll take a hoe. It'll take a Mm -hmm. lot of equipment to get it out. It's harder to deal with. So every single day I do a hard inventory at night. Okay. Who am I mad at? Mm -hmm. Who am I ticked off at? Who have I not forgiven today? You know, Mm -hmm. where was I ugly? Where did I say something or, or spit something to the wind? That was a bow. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to deal with me every (laughs) single day. And you live like this. You don't have time to judge anybody else. Right. That's the truth. Yeah, that really is the truth. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You're describing um, uh, some of the different layers of self-protection and how we have to get almost rewired to learn how to be vulnerable in that honest place where what's the scripture that talks about coming to him with our face unveiled mm. and we, and we look into the mirror of his glory and that's what transforms us. So it's the truth of who God is to us that begins to reveal things to us about ourselves right. in those moments. And so if we we're not taking the time to remove the veil, remove the mask, get honest and think, okay, I want to be accountable to, to you, Lord, search me, Holy spirit, as David said, search me and 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 show me and i think if if we could do this more often in in the church community and even in us as a society as humanitarians if we could do this more and let let that truth begin to speak to us but truth has become uh convoluted oh, in our serious. culture <laughs> nobody no, wants to hear about so truth but this is why we need the barometer of God's word to be yeah. our truth, because right. if we're all rewriting and, and, and defining our own truth, then uh, there is no there, there's no bar for how do we treat one another with love, honor and respect, no matter what stage of the game we're in, what, wherever we are on that ladder or in that part of our journey how, you know, what is that barometer of truth? And I love that you bring, um, you know, this level of honesty and vulnerability to the table. And, and that's almost like, that's the new thing that you project for people is to be able to say, it's okay. This is a safe place right. for you to come to the table and to taste and to see that he is good and he loves you right where you are. Would don't you stay take a there. minute? But don't stay right, there. Right, right. Don't you don't we it's not about staying there. And I think I mean you're addressing something that is important for us to understand. Yeah. You know, he doesn't want us staying in the muck and the mire. He came to oh. deliver us out of the miry clay. Uh for you know, if we want to we could talk about all the different things that we get bogged down and we get trapped in, but he wants to deliver us. That's the whole yes. point, because there is a there is a higher place of being and becoming and an enlargement that we don't understand when we're trapped in yeah. those places. And so um, I believe we've got, I mean, in the next 30 seconds, could you minister to that person who is just feeling a little bit out of sorts right now and they've stumbled on this program and they're, they're going, well, you know, I've judged a lot of leadership and and I've also been in the position where I've, I've lied a lot about who I am, but I'm frustrated right now and I'm having some internal earthquakes. 
Could you minister to that person yeah. right now about the hope on their horizon? Yeah. Well, you know, John 10.10 10 says this. It's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came for you to have an abundant life. Mm -hmm. Not a life you hate. Not mm -hmm. a life of hiding. Not a life of shame and never feeling good enough or, you know, feeling judged or I'll, I'll never be what I'm supposed to be because I've done X, Y, and Z. Jesus paid the price for our sin. It's paid for because he knew you couldn't pay for it. I couldn't pay for it. So I would encourage you today to do the hard work, mm -hmm. to do the heart inventory, to say, I'm going to deal with me. I'm not going to worry about you, you or you, but I'm going to deal with me so that I can live this abundant life. It's, it's not quick. It's not easy. It's a process, but it is so worth it. I am a living testimony that you can come out of darkness, walk into light, and your tomorrow can be better than your today. Amen. Oh, my friend, thank you for being with me today and for sharing from your heart and the treasures that you have accumulated on your journey. Pastor Hope, before we go, I need you to tell us how people can find you and about the resources you have to offer. Absolutely, Brenda. you got to get my book. You've got to get The Most Beautiful Disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out in May 2021, and it has just been transforming and revolutionizing people's lives. So thank you, Jesus, for giving me the courage to write the book and tell the story. Uh, you can go to Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, anywhere books are sold, and you can get The Most Beautiful Disaster. Of course, we're on all the social media platforms. Instagram is at pastorhope.carpenter. Uh, Facebook is at Pastor Hope C. Um, we have a podcast. It's on Apple, Spotify. It's called Ron and Hope Unfiltered. And we have had a ball with that podcast. It has been so much fun. And we just started a brand new thing, Brenda. It's so interesting. It's called RIFF, R-I-F-F. -F. And it's a, <laughs> uh, it is a uh, social media platform. And it's, awesome. and it's totally secular. We're, we're on, we're the first Christians um, wow. to be on this platform. And Ron has on Tuesday evening at six o'clock Pacific time, it's called Ask Me Anything, AMA. And people are coming, I mean, non-Christians galore because wow. they're on the platform asking him about the Lord and, and church and Jesus and salvation and the walk of Christianity and healing and and prosperity and just asking him anything. It's been very mm. interesting. And on Wednesday mornings, I'm on this riff app um, at nine o'clock Pacific doing pray and slay. And so we just pray. I talk about prayer and we have about 45 minutes where we take prayer requests. It's just an amazing time. So we're on all that fun stuff. We stay pretty busy, but uh, come and find me and let's be friends. I appreciate you. And uh, thank you for you, taking Crouch. the time. <laughs> I love you too. And we need to spend some time together. Listen, yes. spring is around the corner. <laughs> we got to connect in California. Yes. <laughs> well, listen, folks, I'm so glad, my friends, that you have taken the time as well out of your day. That's an investment in you. And uh, we appreciate you being here. We just want you to know that whatever it is that you are carrying, whatever is dragging you down, holding you back, causing you to be split within your own identity and frustrated and not reaching the potential that you know that you know is there, but you desire it, we invite you to lay it all down, come clean, step into the light and invite Jesus to be a part of what you are afraid to go to. He will give you the courage. He will give you the wisdom and he'll bring you through. Just as my friend Hope has told you, there is hope for you <laughs> just on the other side of that fear. So thank you again and have a blessed day. I'm Brenda Crowley.